Well, hello, my name is John Sinclair. Today we're going to talk about the building of our authentic Italian Pompeii style wood fired pizza oven. It took a community to raise this oven. First, a bit of a cautionary tale the project you are about to see detailed was remarkable in four ways. One, it was way more expensive than originally budgeted. I didn't have a budget in mind, but um, but whatever I was expecting, uh, I was wrong. This is not an inexpensive proposition, even if you're doing it yourself. So, uh, be prepared to spend uh, to spend a bit. But I will argue now, having finished the project and having had some time with the oven, that it's worth every penny. Two, it took way longer to build than originally estimated. I foolishly thought it would take four weekends, a total of eight days, to complete. I was kind of right. It took four weekends in April, four in May, four in June, July, August, September, October. In fact, it wasn't totally finished until just before Christmas in December. So make sure you've got enough time for the project. Three, it couldn't have been complete without the help of a few skilled tradesmen, of who you'll see, and lots of volunteer hours from friends and family. Great project to bring people together. Four, it was worth every penny and every hour. People love coming over now to our place uh, because they're guaranteed the oven will be going. And we've used it to cook pasta and roast vegetables and do breakfast, lunch, dinners, uh, meats. Uh, the list goes on and on to include, of course, fantastic, authentic pizza. The construction site uh, is, uh, is our property uh, on Little Long Lake uh, in Sydenham, Ontario, north of Kingston. It's a, uh, it's a uh, rural property. And as you can see, there's an existing concrete pad. The new pad for the pizza oven and outdoor kitchen is going to be placed right here. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that this, this area is fill. And it's subject to settling, and it's subject to frost because we're in a very cold climate here. Uh, that's a risk for us. This hill is very steep. It's probably about 15, 20, 25 feet at, at points. And the fill was put here 15, 20 years ago when the house was built. So it was all bulldozed fill. It has settled, but not settled completely. So to avoid a disaster, the disaster being frost moving it and cracking our pad and shifting our oven, uh, we had to take uh, we had to take some civil engineering steps uh, into into consideration. This is uh, two two additional photos to give you a sense as to uh, where the uh, where the slab for the oven is going to go, and it's going to go right in here. Like any good project, you have to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, then you won't know when you're deviating from that plan. Uh, so this was our these were our plans. We of course wanted the pizza oven as the centerpiece and on the to the right of that We wanted to have a countertop area and on the left We wanted to have our grill or our, our barbecue So a slot for the barbecue to go in the pizza oven will sit up here at uh, chest height a countertop and then we picked up this lantern uh, gas lantern uh, on our travels into New Orleans. I uh, really like it. It's a, it's a not welded. It's a riveted uh, unit, very authentic, and we wanted to incorporate it somehow into our pizza oven outdoor kitchen. So we designed a post here, which we would, we, we would clad in stone, uh, mount the lantern up here, and then run a gas line down to a propane tank sitting uh, sitting under the, underneath the uh, countertops. So that, that was our plan starting out. We also uh, had the uh, printed plans from Forno Bravo out in California. Their plans were invaluable. They, uh, we read them from cover to cover and it walked us through the, the process of building, uh, building the oven. We tried to follow their plans as closely as possible. We had to deviate at certain points, frankly, because some of their measurements uh, didn't add up. Uh, but having said that, it's a good general guide at the end of the day, you're always going to have to improvise when you build your oven. So uh, don't think that you can engineer and plan every brick because you can't. You need to start off building it and tweak your design uh, as you progress. 
So now our construction starts. Uh, we start off by having uh, Brian Silver, our good friend from across the lake, come over uh, with his uh, backhoe, and we started uh, digging the hole. You'll notice that in this picture on the left, it is raining. It was a miserable, cold, wet day. Uh, we used this tent, the green tent in that photo, to keep us dry and to keep us shaded and to keep the oven dry throughout the project. If you don't have a very large, very sturdy tent that can withstand storms and be there at the end of the day, uh, you need to get one for the project. Literally couldn't have done the project without the tent. Probably the most useful tool uh, of all the tools that we, that we had. Your oven cannot get wet. Your fire brick cannot get wet while you're building it. It's going to take you weeks to build your oven. So plan on keeping the whole thing dry. The advantage of the tent is that we could move it off to the side if we didn't want it and put it back in place. We'd strap down the legs uh, with some tie-down straps to keep the whole, thing in, uh, the whole thing in place. Because we're building on fill, we, uh, we dug down to the depth of the backhoe. You can see the trench back here adjacent to the existing pad. We dug down seven, seven and a half feet. We put the big feet down and then the sauna tube sit on top of that. The concrete flows down through the tube and into the Bigfoot base just to give it a solid foundation, almost like if you're, fam if you're familiar with pilings. So we use three of these, one, two, and three. And then we backfilled uh, the trench once, they, uh, once the concrete was poured and then uh, worked on the compaction. This is the day that we uh, filled the sauna tubes and the, the Bigfoots. We had Mason, Bo, and Brian uh, on concrete duty that day. Beautiful sunny day. Here you can see the three tubes. We've almost backfilled to the top. And then once we got to the top, we started working on the, on the, the forming for the concrete uh, slab. You can notice that uh, each piling at the top of it has a galvanized heavy duty bolt sticking out of the uh, concrete. And that's to help it grab and adhere to the concrete pad that's going to be poured on top of them. You'll also notice at the top of the photo here, there's the uh, diesel powered compactor or tamper. And as we were backfilling, we ran the tamper and we put a garden hose to it to try to get um, the backfill as compacted as possible to uh, reduce any settling underneath the concrete pad. We also backfilled with a lot of uh, crushed stone to allow water to drain away and not uh, freeze and uh, split crack the concrete pad. A good shot here of the compactor. The forming's underway. The, just to give it a bit of a fancier look at the back side, we decided to go with rounded, uh, rounded edges, so we formed them up. And then to support them when the concrete was being poured over here, we backfilled them with a little bit of crushed stone um, for support. Here's another view of that concrete bolt I mentioned earlier. Another view just before the concrete comes in. You can see we've also added now the heavy gauge rebar. We've drilled in horizontally into the existing concrete slab anywhere from 8 to 12 inches. We then put some epoxy, two-part epoxy, and then ran the rebar in, uh, cut the rebar, and uh, the rebar is to give the uh, concrete pad some strength, of course, but it's also to tie the new pad to the existing pad. So the combination of tying the two pads together and also um, having these three pilings underneath the support will hopefully protect this from settling um, settlement over time and from the frost, although time will tell. It was now time to bring in the, uh, the materials. So we had a steel frame delivered. Um, uh, Curtis and Mitchell here are unloading um, uh, Curtis's pickup truck and the fire brick. So the first thing I'll point out to you is the fire brick. This is a specialty fire brick that can withstand a temperature of 3,000 degrees. Yes, you can buy fire brick, what they call fire brick, at Lowe's or Home Depot. It's not this type of fire brick. This is a medium grade fire brick. It can withstand much, much higher temperatures than can anything you can buy at your local uh, building supply place. So you need to find a supplier of refractory kiln fire brick. It's not easy to find. It's more expensive. It's very inconvenient, but it's your only option. 
If you don't use the right mortar and you don't use the right fire brick, your oven will not withstand the temperatures of a pizza oven and it will eventually crumble, fall apart, and you will be devastated. So you can cheap out on a few things. Materials here, you really cannot. I'll talk about the mortar in a minute, but the other thing I'll point out to you is the steel galvanized frame. You have essentially two options. Option number one is to uh, build a frame out of a cement block and mortar. The other is to use a steel, or in this case, a galvanized frame. There are, tr are pros and cons to each. We went with the steel frame. We found a supplier that could supply us with the steel frame, not only for the oven, but for the left and right piece for the outdoor kitchen components. And we went that route. Uh, we could easily, just as easily have gone with a uh, cement block approach. Um, so that's one decision that needs to be made, uh, made up front early in the process. With the frame uh, delivered, we then picked up some uh, cement board and clad it to the outside of the centerpiece of which the pizza oven is going to sit on up here. You'll notice that we brought the cement board up, oh, four, four and a half inches above the steel frame and we put a floor in the bottom here. And that's what we're doing in this picture. You've got Matt, Frank, and myself applying a cement board to the frame. And that's to allow for the concrete that's going to go uh, on top to make the countertop. Underneath on the front, we cut out a dog hole, dog house hole, if you will, and that's for a dry firewood storage uh, when the unit is finished. A lot of people thought the uh, the fire goes in here and the food goes, uh, the fire goes in here and the food goes up top. Uh, and of course, as you know, that's not that's not correct. This is strictly for firewood, uh, firewood storage. With the uh, cement board uh, adhered to the frame, we then put in some uh, rebar, taped off our joints, and mixed up concrete in a mixer and started shoveling in concrete, finished it off flush with the top of the cement board. All of this cement is not going to be visible. All this concrete will, uh, will, will disappear. So it didn't really need to be finished that well, except it needed to be level. Once we were done, we put uh, something underneath, covered the whole thing in plastic and taped it up so the, the rain would stay off the concrete until we were ready for the next step. And the next step was the beginning of the actual construction of the pizza oven. So up to this point, it's been fun, but really hasn't been all that rewarding. Now it starts to get very interesting and more technical. You can see the concrete countertop here and then we have two inches of rigid high heat ceramic insulating board and that's cut out to the shape of the oven that's to separate the heat of the fire which will be up here from going down into the concrete for two reasons one you don't want to lose any heat from your oven heat will go up but it will also radiate down two you want to protect your cement from cracking because this is going to be a high heat oven. So for two reasons, you need to invest in this and it is expensive. It's a specialty item. Again, it comes from specialty shops, uh, two inch thick um, ceramic board underneath. On top of that, we dry stack the oven floor. We do it in a herringbone pattern. That allows uh, minimal friction when sliding things in and out of the oven, i.e. pizzas, pots, pans. So the floor is dry stacked on top of the insulation. The insulation sits on top of the concrete slab. And then we laid out, we started to dry stack uh, the oven, uh, first course for the dome. Now the floor is dry stacked. There's no mortar between those joints even when we're done. And this insulation is, lit is literally just sitting on top of the, of the concrete. We only began to use mortar when we began to lay in the first course of brick. You'll also notice that the first course of brick, and you can see that in the third photo, perhaps best, you can see the bricks are um, stacked in a vertical orientation, and they are cut in half, so they're half the length, but they're all stacked, uh, all stacked vertically. This is before the mortar was applied. And you can see it here, so concrete, insulating board, floor, first course on edge, and then the second course, third course, and so on and so forth, 
they're all laid on the flat. So we laid up, we laid, we laid this out, and then uh, had Matt, uh, our mason, come over, and then we really got down to business. So here's the oven again, the insulating board. The first course, you can see that the these are all mortared into place now. We are using a tool, homemade tool, called the indispensable tool. You make it yourself. I will be honest and tell you that I struggle with making one. It should be a fairly straightforward uh, thing to make. I uh, didn't use a strong enough hinge. Um, if I was doing it again, I would spend the extra time to make sure that you get this right. I would also take a piece of plywood and cut the plywood out round in the exact diameter or circumference of the, of the oven. And I would screw in the uh, hinge to that plywood. So that plywood cannot shift left or right. It's completely immobile. And with it being immobile, so too will be your uh, indispensable tool. And this tool, of course, it's hinged. And so as you do each course, you're, you're raising this tool to get the right, um, the right diameter for your dome going forward. You can see it being used here. Uh, as we're mortaring in the third course. So here's one, two, we're now starting the third course, and this would be the doorway or the hearth for the oven. I believe our hearth from left to right was 18 inches. There were thou not thousands, there were hundreds and hundreds of cuts to make uh, for, the, uh, for the fire bricks. I had read that people suggested renting a saw or using a four inch a handheld grinder or someone even suggested just using a hammer and chisel all of those will work all of those are horrible ideas you need to do what I ended up realizing and that is go out and buy either new or used a wet a 10 inch wet tile saw I bought it used it for the project used it for hundreds and hundreds of cuts and now that the project is finished I will sell the I will sell the saw so Beth and Spencer were two amongst a handful of people that we had to recruit into uh, into running the saw for us. So uh, you'll need the saw. We needed it for many, many days. Renting it was just clearly not an option. Uh, really good investment and glad I did it. I mentioned earlier the mortar. So the image on the left is a pail of the mortar. You don't have to mix more uh, water with this high heat mortar. It comes pre-mixed in these, uh, in these uh, buckets. This mortar has a, a temperature rating of 3,000 degrees, so it's very high heat mortar, and that's what you want to use. It's actually an yeah, excellent mortar to use. It's very simple. Uh, the middle photo, let's see here. We've got uh, two courses down. You can see, uh, and you'll see it clearly here in a minute, but as each course was done, we washed the inside using a wet towel, wet t-shirt, and I mean soaking wet, to uh, wash off the mortar joints. The inside mortar joints need to be uh, need to stand at attention because that's what you're going to see. The outside of the oven, you're going to see none of this work. The inside, everyone's going to look in the oven and check out your uh, your handiwork. This is what I was talking about. So these are unwashed joints right here that we've just laid in. So we'll then come back and we'll take our fingers and make sure that that mortar is all nicely pressed into each joint, that there's no cracks, no crevices, no holes. And then when that's done, we'll come back a couple of times and we'll wash the joints. Look how nice those joints are right here. And any gaps are filled in with mortar. This thing has to be airtight. As our dome takes to, uh, begins to take shape, it's now time then to uh, begin focusing on the hearth, and the hearth consists of an inner arch and an outer arch. This is the form that will be used to uh, lay the bricks on top to build the inner arch, and when that arch is done, we'll move this form forward and we'll put an arch out here at the, at the opening. The gap between this inner arch and the future outer arch, the gap in between up top is where we will exhaust uh, the gases and the smoke uh, up a chimney. So did we have all of this engineered before we started? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, you kind of have to start the uh, start your dome, start your oven, and figure this out as you go. I don't think anyone's got very good detailed plans, and you really don't need them. Everyone's going to do, do it a little bit differently. 
uh, and yours will work out fine. You'll also notice that the form here is actually two sheets of plywood with I think a two by four in between so that it's freestanding. You'll also notice that there are shims used to hold the, uh, the form, arch form in place so that we can retract it later, we can pull it out later once it's been bricked in place. Otherwise, it might be very difficult to remove. We've also cut a hole in the bottom, and that's just to be able to get our fingers inside to, to get a grip of this thing to move it forward and, and remove it. You can see here, we've now begun the uh, outer arch. These are being dry stacked, so we, we would dry stack and build it once before we uh, and cut, the, cut the bricks to shape before we uh, start applying the mortar. These uh, red bricks here are just adding uh, stability. They're just dry stacked right now because as you build the arch, of course, there'll be downward pressure uh, moving or outward, outward and downward pressure. So we just put them there as temporary, uh, temporary support. Here's a good view here. You can see some shims, the hole, the arch has now been mortared in. There's the keystone. Uh, and again here, now the red bricks have been, have been mortared in place to give the, uh, the whole thing uh, some structural support. Same thing here as we continue on with the, uh, with the process. We're just uh, filling in uh, here up top. And again, this is where the chimney will go. There's a gap. So the smoke, smoke gases will come out and go up straight up uh, the future chimney. You can still see here in this picture the cement, the insulating board, the floor, the first course. A good view here of the inside, that first course uh, on edge, and then every other course on the flat. You can see the arches here. You'll notice that we've used wedges in certain places where there were gaps. Uh, instead of filling it with mortar, fire brick is better than mortar, so we filled the, the large pieces with uh, with wedges of um, fire brick and uh, and then mortared over it. You can see the, the wet towel that we used to wash all the mortar joints. Again, not focusing so much on the outside, but paying a lot of attention to the inside of the oven. There are different ways to support your, uh, your dome while you're building it. We just use these uh, pegs, one peg per, uh, per fire brick. In some cases, we could remove them 10 minutes later. Other cases, it was an hour later. We would go back after they had somewhat cured, uh, patch any uh, gaps with the, uh, with the mortar that was hanging here, and then we would wash it. So you can see the washed areas versus the unwashed areas here as we're, uh, as we're building the dome and supporting the dome as we go. So you can see where the chimney is going to go just off screen here in this image. Starting to get exciting here. The, uh, the dome is almost completed. Here's the first arch, the second arch is out here. There's the gap for the chimney. There's the flange that's gonna go under the, uh, the stone cap, which you'll see raised in place in a few minutes. We had some extra mortar, so we applied some mortar on the outside of the dome. We had the mortar, so why not use it? Again, trying to uh, make the whole thing as watertight and as airtight as possible. And you can see here where the flange is going to sit, a bed of mortar, the flange, and then the stone cap is going to go on here with the chimney going up. So with our design, we now needed at this point to install a, a surround. We did look uh, at uh, granite countertops for this, uh, this section here and for the outdoor kitchen components to come later. Uh, we ruled them out from an expense perspective and timing perspective. It was gonna take time and it was gonna cost more than we, uh, we had budgeted. So we abandoned that. Well, then, we, then we had a great idea. What about cement, polished cement countertops? So we had a contractor come in who specializes in that and gave us a quote. And believe it or not, that was more expensive than, uh, than the granite. So we opted instead for limestone went to a well went to a bunch of landscape professional landscape supply places and found back in the yard of one of them some Chinese two inch imported limestone uh, slabs and uh, purchased that then went home and took uh, some foam and cut out a series of templates 
to make up the surround, took the stone and the templates to a uh, place to have them cut. So you can see here uh, a number of pieces of foam um, all cut, including including the foam for the capstone for uh, for the chimney. So there's a one, two, three. There's at least six pieces here going around, and then one up top for the uh, for the surround. It was important to get these right. You'll notice that the foam overhangs the actual cement, and that was deliberate. We wanted to have an overhang to get any water away from uh, away from not only the dome, have the water run off, and have the water go to the uh, go to the ground. This is a picture of the uh, stone. That's a Chinese limestone being cut according to the uh, templates that we traced out on them from the foam. You'll also see in the center image the boring of the uh, the hole for the chimney. So that that would have been next to impossible without uh, without the proper tools. There's the actual piece that came out from the bore hole. So there's our six pieces, and then there's of course the additional piece for the uh, capstone for the chimney. This is uh, Dave Baker and myself installing the uh, the stone pieces, uh, the six of them. We didn't install the capstone on this day. We installed the six here. We shimmed each one to give it a slight slope away from the away from the, the brickwork, away from the uh, the oven, and we used uh, just an adhesive on the inside. You can see the pencil mark uh, indicating uh, where the adhesive needs to go. You'll also notice that we scored the bottom outside edge. Uh, of all of the stone, including the top capstone, to give it what's known a drip edge so that any water uh, will run uh, down across and hit hit here and then fall to the ground and not track backwards to, towards the uh, towards the pizza oven. The next step was to install this uh, white ceramic um, it's wool, actually it's wool insulating blanket is what it is. It's, uh, it's nasty stuff. Uh, you need to wear not just a mask, you need to wear a, a respirator. You need to wear uh, clothing from uh, head to toe. You don't want to breathe or touch this stuff. What you want to do is you want to cut two one inch layers. So it comes in it's one inch blankets and rolls and you need to cut it to size. Cover the whole dome with insulation right up to and tight up against your uh, hearth and then uh, put a second layer overlapping the, uh, the joints. You want to make this insulating blanket as effective as possible. If you have enough material, put on a third layer. Again, you cannot have enough insulation. You want to retain all that heat in your oven so after you're done cooking high heat foods like pizza that you can then use the oven over the next couple of days to cook a lower heat foods uh, like, like breads. So with the insulating blanket in place, the next step is to uh, apply a layer of chicken wire. Basically, it's like a, a laugh or a laugh coat. The chicken wire goes on. It's not an exact science. Make it fit. Uh, wear gloves. Trim it as necessary. Scrunch it down. Apply it over the uh, layers of insulating blanket. And then you're going to lay on some Matrolite. Matrolite is a uh, high heat insulating mortar that goes on top of your insulation. You mix it, it comes in bags, it comes dry. You mix it in a wheelbarrow or in a mixer with, uh, with water according to the instructions and you apply it just like you would mortar with a trowel. You want at least uh, two inches of this. If you have any extra, uh, use it. Again, the more insulation the better. I find that when you're dealing with most suppliers that they're going to send you just enough to get the job done. So if you're buying your materials in a kit, order extra mortar, order extra insulating blanket, and order uh, extra mat matrolite um, mortar. You need extra of everything to do it properly. They're going to give you the bare minimum, and the bare minimum in my case didn't even come close. So uh, you need these materials. It adds to the expense. But by this point, you're so deep into it, you, you don't have much choice. So the Matrolite coat goes on, and it almost looks like a finishing coat, but it's really not finished. 
The Matrix Light is supposed to be waterproof, but really on top of that, you want to put a real waterproof barrier to keep any moisture outside of the oven. You'll know if, you're, if you've insulated your oven well enough when it's going, uh, and it's a thousand degrees inside, and it's been a thousand degrees for an hour, when you touch the outside of your dome, it should barely be warm to the touch. If that's, if that's how your oven ends up, then you know you've done a great job on the insulation. When it's snowing here, if I light the oven and there's snow on top, it takes a long time for the snow to melt on top of the oven, which is just proof of the insulation value. So this is the stucco being applied. Stucco comes in any number of colors. You can, this you can get at your local building supply center. Uh, you typically uh, order it. They'll, they'll have it made up for you. Uh, one bucket was enough to do our whole dome and then leave lots, lots extra. Uh, colors up to you. We went with a color that we thought was um, somewhat traditional looking. It was my first time ever applying stucco. It's very simple to do. There's a number of ways to give different finishes to stucco. You can do a trowel finish. There's different styles of trowel finishes. You can brush it. You can use a broom, towel. Uh, if you go onto YouTube and um, watch some stucco being applied, you'll get the idea. And you can also just wing it once you're, uh, once you're applying it. It uh, gives a really nice uh, nice finish to it, and uh, it makes the whole thing waterproof. With the stucco applied, uh, it became time for us to build a door. We wanted a, uh, a steel or a metal door. We wanted it insulated. So we turned to our good friend Jeff Kansian, who uh, fabricated a 2-inch thick insulated door. We took some of our extra insulation and put it inside the aluminum door that, uh, that Jeff welded up. We went online and we purchased a commercial high temperature, it goes up to I think 11 or 1200 degrees, thermometer with a 4 inch probe, mounted that on the center of the door, so that probe sticks into the oven interior 2 inches to give us an accurate reading. If uh, when we have a fire, when we are done cooking pizzas, we'll throw a log on the fire, put the door in, and uh, that oven will stay hot for, for literally uh, two days. Now the easiest way to, to, to get the exact dimensions for a very tight fitting door, uh, we only left about an eighth of an inch gap and that middle expands when it's, when it's, when it's hot. So uh, we, we decided that, um, well, Beth decided, it was a good idea to climb into the oven and to stencil it from the outside. So I placed a piece of cardboard uh, or foam over the entrance, over the hearth, and from the inside using the Sharpie here, Beth traced or stenciled the exact shape of our arch. And that's what we gave to Jeff. Jeff gave us back this beautiful door. Uh, we then mounted on two metal handles to the door as you'll see uh, in subsequent uh, photos. With, uh, with all of that done, it was time to apply this capstone. So the capstone is actually more complicated than you think because the capstone sits on top of all of this structure here, including the red brick and all the fire brick. Uh, there's the gap inside that allows uh, the heat and gases to escape. And then there's that flange that I pointed out in one of the earlier images. So that flange sits uh, underneath here and goes up into the two inch limestone, um, it was adhered in place with some high heat uh, adhesive. And then uh, the stone, the flange, and the chimney were picked up as a single piece by these two clowns, Dave and Paul, who literally, I mean, this is a, this is a bit of a joke. They, they didn't touch a tool during the whole project. They were missing in action, but they did show up when I needed just uh, brute strength and really nothing else. And they helped me pick that up and set it into a bed of mortar, enclosing the, uh, enclosing the whole thing. So this is what it looks like uh, when it's almost finished. The, the chimney's in place with the uh, rain cap. You, the, the red you see down here, that's a high heat uh, caulking to make sure that it's airtight so all the gases go up the chimney. Um, stones in place, we the lanterns in place. We've now moved the two pieces of framing, the right and the left, in place to begin the outdoor kitchen. 
And the, uh, the oven is essentially done at this point. So now it was the focus on the outdoor kitchen part. I should also say that the curing fires have continued. So here is a very hot curing fire going on. So clearly this was very, uh, very far along in the process. Before we, uh, we, we could uh, finish the outdoor kitchen part, we needed to make some modifications to our galvanized steel frame. So who do we call but welder Mike Mall, a good friend uh, here in Sydenham, came over uh, on a moment's notice with his uh, mobile welding equipment, and uh, an hour later uh, it was done. So a big thank you, uh, a big thank you to Mike. So here we can see Matt applying uh, cultured stone, which is the stone that we went as the surround stone on the outdoor kitchen part. You can finish this with brick. You can use real stone, cultured stone. You could parge it. You could use stucco. Uh, any number of ways to uh, finish this. We went with, uh, with cultured stone. So you can see the cement board and then the lath, the scratch coat gets put on just before the stone gets put on. Uh, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot longer than you think um, than it's going to take originally but the finished product looks uh, looks great. Stone, let's come back here. Stone for the surround and stainless steel uh, for the countertops here, here, and here. The stonework goes up on the post. There's the gas lantern. The gas line runs down. You can see the handles are, uh, are now on the door. Caps in place, chimneys in place. Uh, we simply need to throw some firewood in here to give it that finished look. You'll also notice that there's on uh, the beginning of uh, winters here. There's a bit of snow on the ground. So this project started in April and was finished uh, in the month of December. So some of you might know that there's a bit of a tradition when it comes to uh, giving, uh, giving wood-fired ovens a name. And while we were building ours, we struggled with the name. I didn't have a good name. Finally, Beth one day said, hey, let's call it Carmenier. So we ended up calling it Carmenier. Carmenier is an old world grape variety that now grows predominantly in Chile. It's our go-to wine. And we, uh, we drank a lot of that wine, uh, dreaming of the oven and building the oven. And so it's only appropriate that she be called Carmenier. But it gets even better. We came up with a rule that only those that actually dirtied their hands, that got their hands in the mortar and cut bricks and carried bricks and cut steel and welded, only these, uh, these, these elite people have earned the privilege of calling her by her more informal name, her casual name, and that is Carmen. To all others, she will forever be referred to as Carmenier. We went online and had a stainless steel plaque made up in commemoration and the plaque is now mounted on the side of the oven. And this is what the finished product looks like with a roaring fire going in it. You can see the door off to the side here. And again, you'll notice even more snow right now. This is the list of people that need to be thanked one by one uh, for their help. Really wouldn't have been possible without each and every one of them. Uh, they, gave, uh, they gave their time, they gave their effort, they gave their ideas, uh, and just wonderful people. So a big thank you uh, to these people who can call her Carmen. Brian Silver, Matt Holgate, Jeff Kansian, my son Mitchell, my son Spencer, Dave Baker, my partner Beth Reed, Dale Babcook, Bo Babcook, Mason Babcook, how many Babcooks can there be? Frank Kaiser from down the lake, Curtis Monnier from a couple lakes over, Paul Troop from a couple doors down, Dave Folds the same, Mike Mall the welder, good friend John Sr., and John Mark Darion. So, to each and every one of you, thank you so much. We, uh, we have had so much fun cooking in our oven now, uh, and I know you will too. You just need to start the project, have faith, find the right people to help, and it will all come together.